Beta testers can be a blessing or a curse. They'll either help you shape your product or waste valuable time right before you release it. In this episode, I'm joined by Chip Duvall, a beta program manager who has run testing programs for both Peloton and Sonos. During our time, Chip shared his insights into what makes a good tester and how to measure them. You need to find the people that are actually going to use it, engage with you, provide feedback, create that feedback loop that you can then iterate on and improve everything before you release. We discuss considerations to figure out how many testers you need. That's going to go down to what the goals of the project are, and then also if it's hardware or software. Like hardware programs are a lot more expensive to run than software programs. They're going to be small. They have higher logistics costs. They have higher list, uh, risk of leaking the product. But ultimately, you're going to want to look at the value of each tester and back into what is the most efficient way you can run that program. We even touched on the controversial topic of whether or not employees make for good beta testers. I think that the benefits of using employees to test are that you can communicate very easily with them. You can use Slack, you can walk around the corner and knock on their desk, you can run to them in the hallway and remind them of things. The other helpful thing with using internal testers is that they often have a deep understanding of the product, how it works, how it should work. Let's get into the episode. Today I'm joined by Chip Duvall. I'm so excited to have you on. Thanks for joining us, Chip. Thank you, Chris. Happy to be here. So I wanted to start off with a first question because I know you've had some background in not just beta, but alpha and beta. And I, and I really like some of your perspectives on this. Alpha and betas are typically measured on how much data they collect. And since testers are that primary source of data, how would you go about defining what a good tester is? Yeah, I think there are a few different ways to go about that. I think that it's actually one of the first projects I worked on when I joined Sonos, like back in 2015, maybe it was. Um, we were running all of these tests. We had all of these testers providing data, providing feedback, but there was really no way to quantify who was a good tester, who was a bad tester, which testers should be carried forward into future programs, which testers would probably be better off removed and not used going forward. Um, the approach I took there is I, I looked at four bigger buckets of data and feedback that we were getting. I was looking at feature and product usage to understand if something was working, how often are people using it? Um, it helps us understand, are we building what we need to build, right? Are people getting the value that they see out of it? Are they using it and then coming back to use it again and again, or are they only using it when you kind of poke them? Kind of helps be, be somewhat of a, a leading indicator for GA adoption as well. Um, Another bucket would be bug reports, wildly helpful when people help you find bugs, identify kind of critical product issues. That being said, if you were to base tester, uh, like if you're trying to figure out if a tester is good or bad based off of bug reports, it's not really a fair metric, right? Not everybody experiences bugs. Hard to hold that against people, right? Not everyone is gonna have the same software problem. Um, another one would be community engagement. This is one where there really is no excuse for low participation, right? There's nothing stopping somebody from logging into the community trying to figure out if there are any um, tasks they have to do, if there are any conversations they could engage in, ways to interact with other testers and grow that community. Um, and then the last one would be survey responses. So we're, we're going to send you a survey. Are you going to take that survey in one day, four days, five days, seven days? Um, we were actually able to measure at Sonos how long it took people to complete surveys to factor that into how valuable they were. So those are the four buckets that we had, the product usage, bug reports, community engagement, survey responses, we took all of that data and pulled it into MicroStrategy. Um, and then I was able to then weight each of those categories against each other to try to determine who were our good testers, who were our bad testers. We did this for both internal and external testers. And then we were able to draw a line in the sand. I think it was around 75 or 80. If you scored 75 or 80 on a given program, you were automatically rolled into the next program if you wanted to. If you didn't, you would get released back to the wild. Um, just in an effort to maximize the value we get out of our testers, um, because not everybody is the same value. It does take overhead to manage these pools of testers, whether small or large, um, and making sure that you have people that are actively engaged that are going to get you the data that you want, or actually going to use the product when they say they're going to use the product, right? They don't just sign up for something because they want the new shiny object. They get it and then they don't use it, right? You need to find the people that are actually going to use it, engage with you, provide feedback, create that feedback loop that you can then iterate on and improve everything before you release. Yeah, those those are very good, like objective metrics for kind of determining what a tester's doing and how they're you know providing value. Things like they're participating in the test, giving information, they're using the product, 
um, which gives you um, more uh, behavioral data, um, and then engaging with things around your program. Those are very good objective metrics. Do you have any thoughts on what would be some more subjective like attitudes? Like when you see a tester, like, Grant, I'm sure you've seen plenty of testers. You can look at the way that they respond to feedback, the way they interact with that community, and you can kind of determine which ones are in a, a different tier than a, a different group of them. Yeah, I tend to lean on the folks that are engaging in the community. Like if you see people posting discussion topics and engaging with other testers, those are the people that I tend to elevate towards the top, right? There were times where we could see somebody, you're, you're supposed to be I don't know, watching TV content. All of a sudden you see that they have 24 hours of usage in a day. Okay, so that person just left the TV on, let it run. Is that helpful? Yes, right? It's good kind of reliability data, understand can we run something that long without any hiccups or audio interruptions. But in the scheme of things, if that's all they're doing, they're not engaging with anybody, they're not taking surveys, are they really helpful? Kind of, right? There's probably some subset of the population that it's helpful to have people that are running those more duration tests, that's fine. But to say that you need a pool full of those people, I don't think you're going to get the value that you need. So I tend to gravitate towards finding the people that are going to be actively engaged, that are going to go back and forth with other testers. They've never met these people before, but somebody says, hey, I like feature X and this is Y. And someone says, hmm, it's okay, but have you considered this? And getting that real back and forth is where the value starts coming out. People start bouncing ideas off of each other, coming up with things that they haven't thought of before, maybe that we haven't thought of before. Um, and it's really the benefit of the community. There's, there's an interesting, um, I'd say it's a best practice for um, market research when you do focus groups. You have to kind of filter out when there's a, um, like a, a domineering um, personality. So there could be someone in that group that can really lead the group think, right? Like they can, they can start getting some of their, their thoughts and, and their motivations and opinions and kind of sway groups. And maybe they're the loudest person in the room. Like, how would you go about ensuring that you're not finding only, you know, a handful that are very dominating personalities that take over that, that test? Yeah, I think there you just have to look at the number of discussions people are engaged with and the types of discussions that they're having, and then also the type of kind of advice or feedback that they're giving. Um, mm -hmm. People that are genuinely trying to help others that are jumping into the technical troubleshooting, hey, I'm having a problem with this. Sometimes it takes a few hours for the beta technical folks to reply. Sometimes they're on it right away, but oftentimes other people are chiming in right away. Have you tried this? This worked for me. Or maybe you could change this setting. That has how I got around it. Or I experienced something similar last week, and this is what I was advised to go do. So those are the types of people you want, not just the people that are kind of posting more, not controversial topics, but the people that are talking like with very strong opinions about a product and how they want to use it. Okay, maybe, maybe somewhat valuable, but also it's a product for, I guess, speaking specifically about Sonos, it's a product for millions of people. Right. When I was at Peloton, it's a product for millions of people. The opinion of one is is great. If five or six other people agree with it, okay, also great. But in reality, they're not going to speak for the masses. And you've got to be able to read that, understand that, and kind of navigate as you need to. Yeah, it's definitely tough because you, you're looking for some kind of like, I don't want to say statistically significant, but like you want to have a good representation. Like it doesn't yep. need to be, you don't want all of those really strong personalities, but you don't you also don't want none of them because sometimes they, those, that, that group can be very, um, uh, they, they can get straight to the point. They can give you the feedback that like, sometimes you just need to hear that. And then you weigh it against things like the, the general population, uh, especially when you have people that are extremely helpful. Usually like those people do really well in situations where they, where people need help. And yep. when you have a good group of testers, you get like those, those different personalities. Yeah. So, sometimes those are your early adopters too, right? The people that are going to be super vocal and opinionated about something. If those are the people you can win over, those are the people that are going to go spread awareness of what you're doing, why you're doing it, how it's helpful, why it's such a great idea. And that kind of helped magnifies everything that you're doing. Yeah. So yeah. what, what advice would you have to someone? So someone starts up their program, how would they go about trying to make sure that they get some kind of sample like that where, where they have these different personalities? That's a good question. I think that the best way to do it would be to figure out some sort of, uh, I don't know if it's sliding scale or 
different types of personas that have different characteristics that you could look at. And then that's how you back into your tester pool. You can create different types of diversity buckets. You can create different types of tester types. And then as you go about populating your program, you can be a little bit more intentional about it. Um, towards the later time that I was at Sonos and all of the time that I was at Peloton, we were more focused on filling out a well-rounded beta population. Whereas when I first started at Sonos, there were times where, okay, we needed 5,000 testers, uh, go find the 5,000 people that use the product the most. Okay, grab all of them. Where are they from? Yeah, doesn't matter, right? What do they look like? Doesn't matter. What music services do they use? Doesn't matter. So being a little bit more intentional about what you're doing. And I think a lot of that comes down to doing the prep work. If you can understand from the beginning, what are the test cases that you have to cover and who are the ideal test cases, or who are the ideal testers to support those test cases, that'll go a long ways towards ensuring you get the data that you need. Because you, you could run into situations where you fill your population with all sorts of testers that fit specific profiles. But then if you look at your test cases and they don't line up against the people that you've put in your in, in, into your beta pool, you're not going to get what you need out of it. You're going to have to go through and backfill your beta pool later at a later time when you realize you don't have the data that you need. A, a lot of these beta programs come down to upfront planning. You got to do all the work upfront so that once the program goes, you're, I don't want to say more or less pressing buttons, but you're pretty much just pressing buttons, releasing surveys, analyzing data at that point, because you've done all the upfront work to front load your program with the right testers, the right test cases, the right surveys, the right tasks. Um, it's kind of the way I've always approached things. Yeah, there's. Um, we're, we were just writing. This is something that I was talking to Austin, our, our one of our content manager. Um, we were talking about we're creating a new communication guide, and there's a lot of people that have tests running. Like right now, they're in the middle of a test, and a lot of the times we we want to say like, oh, you know, some best advice is is that planning stage, um, ensuring you get the right people into your test. Some people are in a test right now; they have the testers that they have. So a lot of times that we we struggle that like we have to give them some advice like what would you do in a situation where you, you have to work with what you got how are you going to convince the group of testers you have right now that aren't necessarily the best that you, you maybe don't have those more in-depth profiling um how would you go about dealing with the group that you have now yeah in a situation like that it almost comes down to don't want to say micromanaging, but when you have that, you need to micromanage that. You need to put in specific tasks and ask specific surveys that are going to pull information out of people. Mm. If you don't have the right testers that are going to proactively push it to you. And that's something that, again, it's a, it's the planning. It takes time. It takes foresight. It takes thinking. You have to really sit down and anticipate what people are going to ask, what challenges they're going to run into, how they're going to get around them. But do, doing a lot of that upfront work will let you succeed down the road. Um, but yeah, if, if you're, you got a pool, that's who it is. You have no option to add other people. It's just putting in very specific tasks, very specific surveys that are going to get you the data that you know, you need that, you know, your stakeholders are going to ask for that. You're going to be measured either success or failure of a program on. All right. Great advice. I'm love to hop to our next question. Um, I get a lot of debate on this on, on different companies. And I, I know at Sonos, you'd had varying sizes of, um, programs. But how would you go about determining how many testers you need on a given project? That's going to go down to what the goals of the project are. And then also if it's hardware or software, right? Hardware mm -hmm. programs are a lot more expensive to run than software programs. They're going to be smaller. They have higher logistics costs. They have higher list, uh, risk of leaking the product. But ultimately, you're going to want to look at the value of each tester and back into what is the most efficient way you can run that program. Um, a fun little story of this. Um, it was actually one of the things I did. Maybe the second or third year I was at Sonos, we had this massive public beta program, which had upwards of 100,000 people in it. It wasn't running in the community or anything. Um, it was just an opt-in program from the phone. And it had a lot of overhead. Um, we had to translate all of our communications into it was like six or eight different languages. So we had to code up, we had to write up the emails. We had to send those emails for translations. We had to use Dreamweaver and CSS to configure the emails and send them out. Um, it was a pretty big overhead lift on our team. Um, I took the approach of looking at data over the prior two years to understand the value of each tester there. And we were able to figure out that if we just increased the size of our private beta pools by something like 1500 or 2000, we'd be able to get at the same level of confidence as running these massive public beta programs. So it was kind of like, oh, okay, Chip, I don't know if this is going to work, but let's try it moment. Um, but we ended up doing it. And that was the last public beta program we ever ran at Sonos. 
which I was super excited about. We kind of pulled things a little bit more upstream, front loaded the tests with more people, more of the right people in an effort to collect that data earlier on in the process, which I think is always what we're trying to do. We're trying to get those bugs found as soon as we can so we can fix them. The cost of fixing a bug early on in the program is much cheaper than fixing it towards the end. But more on kind of the, the size of testers, I think that less testers are obviously easier to manage Right. If, if you can run through a program with only 20 or 30 testers and you think you can get the data that you need, great. Um, oftentimes I've seen that or I've, I've seen that lead to situations where you might get one person out of a 20 tester pool reporting an issue. Are you going to spend a ton of resources and time diving into that issue because it's impacting 5% of the tester population? Or are you able to look at kind of the bigger picture of things and see, okay, this is one of 20. Yes, 5% is a big number of impact, but it's a small test pool size. What are the chances that this program or this problem is going to expand out? If we had a hundred testers, would it still be 5%? Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. And those are the types of things where I think you really do need to lean into some of the bigger programs, um, especially if it's a purely software. If it's a purely software program, I don't really see a reason why the program should be any smaller than a few hundred, right? The, the overhead to manage a few hundred people in the community isn't that much. You're sending the same emails, you're sending the same surveys. If you code the surveys correctly with a bunch of binary questions, it's really not hard to analyze those survey results. Um, you only get into trouble with larger tester pools and surveys when you start having the open-ended questions. You obviously have to read through and analyze all of that data, which takes a lot of time. But if you can code the surveys in a strategic way, that helps you get that actionable data with either yes, no questions or kind of sliding scale questions that help you give directional to people like it, to people not like it. You can get away with increasing the pool and also collect the statistically significant size data, which is what you don't get when you have some of these smaller programs. Um, the Peloton programs were much smaller than what we used to run at Sonos. So it was a little bit of a learning curve for me when I was trying to figure out how I could craft these programs and get the same amount of data and actionable insights going from sometimes the, the, the Sonos beta pools were anywhere between like two and 5,000 people and you get to Peloton and they were closer to a few hundred. So how could we get the same insights from a few hundred people that I used to have a few thousand people to work with? Um, and it's really just going back, evaluating that quality of test or finding the people that are going to give you the data that you need and really leaning into them. Definitely. I, I, li I like what you said about, I mean, when you have tests going into it, those goals are so important because a lot of times there's this misunderstanding of, of that they're actually there's theoretically, there's different test types. There's different types of tests you can run that can get different um, get different results. And a lot of times we, we'll get pressure from, especially when we're at big companies, um, to use big numbers. Because the the thought is that I need big numbers. We have a big audience. We need to do this. And it's if we, the executives and, and the, the people at the top won't necessarily know what the go, goal of the test is. Sometimes they'll know, but they'll also pick the wrong test type. So yeah. we get that a lot of times where, we really want to find some bugs before we go out. And it's like, okay, we're going to throw 10,000. We're going to throw 100,000 testers at it. And it's like, they're not thinking about the overhead because yeah. they might be making the same like reference to you know, a test of running 100 people. It's like, you got one beta team. You're fine. You got a, you got a beta program manager. You know, what's the difference between managing 10,000 and, and, and 100 beta testers? Um, and it's a lot of times it, it creates this... Um, this friction, you, if you're set up for a um, small test, like you run small test and they want a bigger test, those systems that you have in place may, may not work for that, that, that big test, which can create a lot of problems with you looking at data. And then, you know, it just, it, it won't do, they won't get the results that they want it anyway. And when yeah. they're suggesting a, a big test. Yeah. Oftentimes too, when you're sending surveys to that many people after the first couple hundred responses, you pretty much know what you're going to get. Right. Yeah, it, get that. It's when you send a survey, okay, we're going to send a survey to 50 people, which means let's say half of them complete it. You have 25 responses. Can you take action off 25 responses? Sure. You can. Are you confident in that action? Maybe Believe not. It, yeah. Right. But if you get a few hundred or a thousand responses, if you add another 5,000 responses on top of that, is it going to change? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a certain threshold that you get at. It might not even be statistically significant compared to what your overall user base is. But there is kind of a magic number out there that once you get a certain number of responses, you know more or less what the audience thinks of what you're doing if you've crafted your pool correctly. Yeah, I, I do the the same thing because surveys are quantitative; it's it's a bigger data set. 
if you were to have this is the the note that I love to make to people if if you were to have 20 people submit the same bug would you would you fix it and like go up and down on that number would you if you had 100 people submit that bug would you would you fix that bug if you had five people fix find that bug and put it out there would you fix that issue and that that is a big deterrent for people that have things like Amazon star ratings and they have those consumer products think about those in terms of reviews, like, yep. you know, disgruntled people will most likely write a review more than the people that are not disgruntled. Yep. Now, what if you had bo- five bad reviews, 10 bad reviews, 15 bad reviews? Now, th- now think about the, the consequences of that. And sometimes you can get a lot further with those smaller numbers and you can manage their participation. You can bubble that yep. stuff up. You could fix stuff faster because you don't have to get 10,000 people online. You don't have to communicate to that many people. So small tests are extremely valuable, and so are large tests. That just comes down to yeah. what you're trying to solve uh, and when in the development you are. You are, and it feels funny, but I feel like there's been more times than it should have happened where we start these programs without a clear understanding of what success looks like. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's something that, as a beta program manager, you really have to kick, yell, and scream for. You need to understand how the program is going to be measured ahead of time so that you know how to structure the program. So you know what you need to get out of it. There have been countless times where we start a program, we get people in there, we onboard them, we get them ready. We start collecting data, we give it back into the the product and the engineering teams. And then what? What happens? What changes? How do we know we're doing well? If we're running some sort of ABCD test on different experiences in the app and option C is performing better than the others, okay, then what? Right? a lot of times those questions aren't asked ahead of time, or there's not a clear guide on how we're going to action off of these once we start learning. And I think as a beta program manager, it's super important up front to get clarity on that, to really hammer home, how am I going to be measured here? What do I need to collect? Once we collect that data, what's going to be done with it? Um, that goes a long way towards running a smooth program. Yes, de- definitely one of my favorite questions as, as a researcher, we're, we're taught this as well. When you're, when you're planning something, you go with what are you trying to learn? What like you try to find objectives? It's you don't want to go straight into what are your objectives? What are your goals? Because they're not going to freaking know. But right. it's like what things do you want to learn? What what things in your head? What questions do you have that you're trying to answer? And then I love switching that. As soon as they give me something, how would you use the information if I got it to you? Would yeah. you, if you got the answer to that, would you change your your um, the way you did it? Would you would you change anything about the product? And if the answer is no, then it's like, do you do then do you actually need it? <laughs> yeah. uh, what, what's the what, what's the situation? Couldn't agree more. Right. All of these asks have overhead associated with them. Mm-hmm. People aren't thinking about it. But hey, yeah. can you send a survey to collect this data? What are you going to do with it? Well, yeah. I'm not really sure. It's kind of nice to know if there's time, I'll make your survey and send it. Yeah, right? I'm not going to prioritize this nice to know information over other things that could be business critical. Yeah, and that's where I you mean, have it's. To- strong enough to push back sometimes it's it's not even like there's there's the resource impact right so you need somebody to go build the survey there's a a impact on your community as well like if you're asking this like there's nothing worse than asking testers to do something that you're not going to be able to use or take action on and they can't see anything back from it so when we asked for things like a survey it's like oh we just we just chiseled away a little bit of that that energy that they have that pool and even their like kind of their expectations so when they submit bugs, we respond to their bugs. If, if they submit bugs and they get nothing back, then they're less likely to do in the future. That's what's going to happen with things like surveys. Maybe you have a yeah. mission critical survey that someone actually has things that they need to answer. Yep. And you have this other one sitting there and they're just like, oh, yeah, I filled that other one, but nothing nothing really came from it. It's fine. I don't, you know, someone else will figure it out. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of these testers are taking time out of their day to do this out of the goodness of their heart, out of the love of the product. Not all of them are getting paid. Sometimes there are paid studies. Sometimes there are rewards for top testers, but a lot of these people are doing it because they truly love the product. They want to help. They want to make it better. And their time isn't free, right? They could be doing a million other things. And if you don't respect their time, they're not going to respect you when you need it. Yeah. That is a perfect segue to my next question. Speaking of paid testers, uh, employees are paid <laughs> uh, to do a specific job. Now, yep. how do employees sit in the realm of being good testers for, for projects? Employees are good for some things and not good for others. Um, I think that 
the benefits of using employees to test are that you can communicate very easily with them. You can use Slack. You can walk around the corner and knock on their desks. You can run into them in the hallway and remind them of things. That's great. You can also, my favorite that I always laugh when I say it, but I, I'm a big fan of public shaming. If I need people to do things, I love posting them to larger Slack channels, thanking the five people that did what I did. It's kind of a subtle way of nudging the other 45 people who said they wanted to test. They got their new shiny object. They're super excited. They told all their friends about it and then they didn't do anything with it. So being able to communicate like that, I find is really helpful. Um, the other helpful thing with using internal testers is that they often have a deep understanding of the product, how it works, how it should work. And when it breaks, they're able to su suggest potential fixes. They're able to troubleshoot a little bit more. So it helps that feedback loop. Um, they're able to provide more detailed bug reports. They can, some of them can pull logs on their own. Some of them, depending on who they are, if they're in engineering, they can even identify what the actual root cause is, put it into a ticket and get it going before my team even touches it, which is really cool. Um, that being said, it's kind of a tricky balance to walk. Employees are working 40 plus hours a week on something. And now you're asking them to go spend extra time that they could be spending with their friends, their family, their kids, their pets working with you. So it's, it's tricky. And I think that a lot of times, at least in the, both the Sonos and the Peloton examples, we've run into issues where it's more significant others or children in the house are running into these issues. And that's something that's really unfortunate, right? If your four-year-old's trying to watch Bluey and all of a sudden there's no sound on your soundbar, what do you do? Do you have time to submit a bug report, submit a diagnostic, try to reproduce it? Or do you just have to factory reset the soundbar and get it working again? It's kind of a weird dynamic that a lot of times these testers that sign up, they either have special setups that they use for these, or they're just people that understand kind of the cost of doing business and they're comfortable with that and they're okay working with that. Whereas when employees sign up for things, oftentimes it's other people in their lives that get impacted by the negative product experiences, which unfortunate, but it's kind of the best we can do. So I guess, yeah, kind of a yes or no. Um, there's, there's also kind of the, the worst case uncomfortable scenario where you give out hardware to an employee, you give out software to an employee, they don't uphold their end of the bargain and you have to recall it. It's kind of un uncomfortable going out to somebody that you might see and work with on a day-to-day -day basis being like, hey, man, I know that you were supposed to do this. You didn't. Can you send it back and get it into a home where we can begin collecting that data? And it's okay, right? It, it, it's not what you want to do. It's not, I don't, don't want to say it's good for relationship building, but in the scheme of things, you're trying to do your job and they've got to understand that. They've got to respect that. Yeah. And there's, there's definitely like you, you've explained that there's a lot of different types of different types of testers. Like if you have an engineering or QA or maybe a more technical employee that ends up being a tester, there are a lot of advantages. Like mm -hmm. you can talk to them, you know, a little bit easier because they understand everything. And if you need a log, they can, they'll probably even be proactive. Like you, you're saying in a lot of cases, and I've always had this approach to, um, uh, like alpha testing and dog footing, just like you would in beta you have those like early adopters and then you have people that become a little, they're a little less technical, maybe that, that general population. I think that that still lives internally as well. Mm -hmm. The difference between a engineering and QA person and a support person and a marketing and a, you know, HR person is like, there's a sliding scale of, of, of technical aptitude. Mm -hmm. So introducing tests that have those along the ways that can scale to those, is a, I think a great way to ensure you get the right kind of participation when you need it the most. Yeah. Kind of circling back to the beginning around quality of testers. One of the tester buckets I had both at Sonos and at Peloton was around which, which of the internal teams that mm -hmm. you're on. You can't, you can't load a project full of engineers and QA folks. You're going to find very different data and experience, experiential feedback than if you include folks from finance and marketing and teams that aren't as quite in the technical weeds. And plus, I also think it really helps them do their job better. If they have a deep understanding of the products that are coming, how to use them, they've actually used them. When someone on the marketing team goes to build out marketing collateral for a product launch, they're going to be able to have much more impactful ideas or ways that they could market this product if they've been using it for the past two months, three months, compared to as if they're working on a project, they view it as just, uh, I've got to go market this speaker. I've never used it. Here's a bullet list of things it can do. Let me go invent something. 
right? Having that hands-on experience goes a long way towards building out something that will really resonate with customers. Yeah. So some of the best advice I was ever given was from a general manager when I worked at uh, Western Digital. We were sitting in a room and we're talking about um, a test that we were going to have going up. And and I had brought up the question is like, is there anybody that we want to include internal for this project? Uh, and he said he'd like to include his, um, his um, sales management team that were in different, uh, they were spread out globally from different regions. And I'm like, that's weird to me. Can you explain like, why, why would you like those people? Cause usually we say like, don't bring in salespeople because like they start selling futures, they get, you know, uh, they, they'll stop selling what they're, they're selling and all these negative things. And he said, what could be really effective is getting the hands and uh, uh, getting the product in their hands prior to launch. So they can start building those strategies of how they're going to start getting their market, their specific market in their that that localized region. And I thought that was so insightful because they get to to use that product beforehand. And instead of waiting till when the product launches, saying, yeah, go get it. It's like, this is going to help us hit our, our numbers. Like it's going to help yeah. that team hit their numbers because they're going to craft a strategy with some knowledge, with some context. Uh, and I, I felt like that was extremely brilliant to to be able to throw into a value that employee testing gives that you wouldn't necessarily think of because we get so caught up in the bug world you know find bugs find us issues like yeah. just do that and it's like that product enablement or product knowledge stuff that you just talked about is so valuable yep same with support getting these things into the hands oh, yeah. of support folks early and often will go a long way towards a good customer experience they're not going to have to rely on pulling up things in an FAQ or reading through a knowledge base to try to find an answer. They've been using it for however many months. They understand what the common problems are. They know what the known issues are because they're familiar with the product. They're able to speak to it more naturally. Yeah, it's definitely valuable. We've talked about it with um, with Danielle uh, Prince from Wise. She she has the same thing. She she started off in uh, support, and the one of the biggest results that they get is getting that support team ready. That's that those knowledge based articles, support articles, it's scripts that the team can go through to find workarounds to be able to explain to people on calls or in emails. And it's just like, they just gotta, they download a whole database of knowledge for them to go out when they when they go out the door with, and then they have the product themselves, and they they know it, they they get to support better, faster. Yep. And it's cheaper because they can do that. <laughs> it all comes back to dollars. Yeah. Cool. So I would love to hop over to our rapid fire questions, if you're going to be into that. Uh, sure. So this would be just a, a handful of questions. Short answers would be great. Um, the first one, describe beta in one to three words. A insightful, undervalued, and I'll call it fun. I love it. It's kind of ever changing and always new and different. Your mind kind of gets to hop around between the, I don't know, four, five, six different projects that you're running at the same time. I find it fun. I do as well. <laughs> Most challenging thing to do in beta. Consistent internal participation, right? Before you can go external, you have to be able to get that quick initial validation and you need those set of 10, 15, 20 internal people that are going to help you get that. Easiest thing about beta. Uh, I alluded it to a second ago, I think staying engaged and, and motivated program structure will loosely stay the same, right? You might have a different duration. You might have a different, uh, different types of softwares that you're working with, but in the scheme of things, it's hardware, it's software, it's ever changing. You're able to learn new and different technologies all the time. So it helps you easily stay connected, engaged, motivated, kind of eye on the prize mentality. One misconception about beta. Uh, you have to be super technical. There have been so many times where you reach out and someone says, oh, I'm, I don't really think I could be a tester. I'm not that technical. And that's like, honestly, that's probably perfect. Right. But I need that. About, I need, I need yeah. You to not be we talked about it a little bit. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Sometimes that outside perspective, like some of the people that are buying the product are going to be my dad. Is my dad technical? Sorry, dad. No, but like you need to have that perspective up front. If you're trying to deliver a feature that not technical people aren't going to understand, you should learn that now versus later. What's your favorite thing about beta? Working with people there. I've, I've said it for years now that meeting people that hear that you work with a product that they love 
and knowing that the job that you have goes directly into delivering those new and exciting experiences that are going to grow that is the best, right? People see a shirt that says Peloton. They see a shirt that says Sonos. Their eyes light up. I have it. I love it. Use it every day. You guys are awesome. That just keeps lighting that fire under you. Yeah. I, I had a quick story. I was wearing a Western digital shirt. I was at Disneyland and some guy came up raving about the WD products. And he's like, oh yeah, I just got this new product. I'm like, yeah. all right, cool. I'm going to go <laughs> go with my family real quick. <laughs> right. yep. Coffee, coffee or tea? I Coffee? I don't, I, I'm not the biggest fan of coffee, but I like what it does to me. So I drink it. It's helpful. How do you unwind? My son recently likes building Legos. So we build towers, we build forts. Um, Sometimes I hit golf balls in my backyard. Are you watching anything on TV now? Uh, Banshee or basketball. The Celtics just came back, so big Celtics fan. Watch all their games. They're back. Doesn't look like uh, the Patriots are doing so hot either. It's okay. They had 20 good years. Yeah. <laughs> Best piece of advice you've been given? I uh, question everything. I think making sure that people know what they're talking about when they're asking you to do things will go a long way towards getting kind of getting the right thing. So that you don't make assumptions based off of what people are asking for. Or if you have any s tiny inclination to say, well, why are we doing that? Or what are we actually trying to do? Ask that question. doesn't matter if you feel stupid in the moment. My daughter must have been given that same uh, piece of advice because she loves to I mean, just question everything. <laughs> it's the only way to make sure things don't slip through the cracks. All right, Chip. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I had a great time talking with you. And I think this is going to be really helpful to a lot of our listeners. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Talk soon.